Now that Russia's president's made his move, all bets are off. Months of Western efforts to stave off another Crimea-style uh, land grab wiped out with the stroke of a pen, it seems. Does Vladimir Putin's decision to recognize breakaway regions of uh, Ukraine's Donbass as independent states mean war? And does it mean all-out war? The sighting of armored vehicles uh, in Donetsk, the sending of so-called peacekeepers, certainly sounds ominous from the other side of the front line, particularly after Monday's speech where Putin claimed that uh, another Vladimir, Lenin, gave away eastern Ukraine when he formed the Soviet Union. We'll ask about the present-day reality and the international community's response. How fast and how hard does uh, the West ratchet up sanctions? At what cost to citizens on both sides? More broadly, uh, how will this grab for the Donbass define the next chapter of the Putin presidency? Today in the France 24 debate, we're wondering if it's war in Europe. Joining us, French Member of Parliament, Natalia Pouzireff of Emmanuel Macron's La République En Marche party. Thanks for being with us. Good evening. Thank you. Thanks as well to uh, former French ambassador to Moscow, Jean de Glignesti, researcher at the French policy think tank Iris. Welcome back to the show. Good evening. Uh, from Glasgow, Anton uh, Barbashin, editorial director at uh, political analysts Riddle Russia. Welcome. Thank you for having me. The France 24 debate, uh, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24Debate. Ukraine belongs uh, to Russia, insisted uh, Vladimir Putin on Monday. He followed it up on uh, Tuesday, uh, stating that uh, the whole of the Donbass, not just uh, the parts that are currently under separatist control, belong to uh, Russia. This in a speech that at times sounded menacing. Everything that I said can change overnight if our partners continue to deploy arms and weapons in Ukraine. It is time to demilitarize modern Ukraine because this is the main factor, the only factor that can be observed objectively and that we can control. Anton Barbashin, how do you interpret uh, Putin's words this Tuesday? Well, essentially, this is war, because Putin clearly made, uh, made it clear that he recognizes territories currently controlled by Ukraine as belonging to the uh, Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. And it is clear that Ukrainian forces will not leave those territories. It is clear Ukraine is not going to demilitarize. Thus, we are looking at a major war. We're looking at a major war. Uh, and why is he taking this all-in approach? Um, it's a puzzle. I mean, uh, there's no rational explanation to why he does what he does. Uh, he stated last night that he believes this is some historic mission that he's fulfilling, essentially, uh, righting the wrongs of Bolsheviks, uh, securing Russia and preventing a potential strike against Russia coming from the United States via Ukraine. Well, this is kind of a conspiracy theory, essentially, that he made state policy. Well, between the Donbass and Crimea is the strategic port city of Mariupol. Mariupol held by Ukrainian government forces. We can cross live now to speak with France 24 senior correspondent uh, Catherine Norris Trent, who is there. Uh, Catherine, um, if you listen to what you just heard from uh, Anton, it sounds like you're in the way of uh, those incoming forces. It does sound like that, doesn't it, Francois? And uh, where I am in Mariupol, uh, there's just been a demonstration in the city centre in this square of a couple of hundred people out on the streets defiant, but also very afraid because they are very aware that major conflict is coming their way, it seems. And they are out tonight calling for peace, but preparing for war. They've been listening to the, the further comments coming from Vladimir Putin, saying that he recognized the extended territories uh, of the, those 
separatist Russia-backed so-called states uh, in uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, and that means that they would also be included within those ex expanded territories. And asking them about that, and they said that they would not accept that, many of them saying that they would stay and defend their city. But there's a lot of fatalism here. People have been preparing for this for some time now, and it, the reality is hitting home for them. Some people through the city have been telling me that they are preparing to leave, that they're wondering about packing up their lives and heading away. Others saying that they are going to plan to stay because they have nowhere else to go and that this is their home, this is their city. Many of them adamant that they are Ukrainians, this is part of Ukraine and they don't want this conflict. Several people saying that they feel that Vladimir Putin has become unhinged and, and crazy and that he needs to be stopped. Others, though, here in Mariupol, you know, sympathetic with the Russian president and saying that they welcome, one lady telling me she welcomed the arrival of what she called Russian peacekeepers into the Donbass, saying she hoped it would stabilise the situation and put an end to the shelling that has been on and off for the past eight years. And we've seen an uptick in that violence along the line of contact between the, that separatist-held territory and Ukrainian government-controlled territory. People here are tired of war. They've been living with this for a long time. Lots of them still have vivid memories and traumas of the, the war back in 2014 and 15, um, but they say they think very clearly that that is heading once again for their city and their region. Catherine Norris Trent, many thanks for that live update uh, from, uh, from Mariupol. Natalia Pouzireff, your reaction? Well, that's obvious. And the French uh, President Emmanuel Macron said it, there's a breach of international agreements. Um, I think that um, it's the same old trick. He's saying that he's going to provide some protection to the people of Donetsk and Luhansk. And, uh, and by uh, saying that, he, Putin means that uh, he has uh, uh, the freedom to move his, uh, his forces across the border. So um, really, it's, um, we can be pessimistic about the turn it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, it's, it's going to take uh, regarding a possible, maybe not the, the, not the, the invasion of whole Ukraine, but, but Russian forces moving uh, into, into uh, Ukraine. Um, and I must say, I was very striken by um, the fact that uh, this weekend, uh, in Russia, uh, managed to organize the evacuation of some people in Donetsk and Luhansk. This means that I think the, the Russian troops were ready to, to move forward at that time and they planned it over the weekend. But it's true that the last months Putin has been uh, uh, sending mi mixed signals, but he's always moving his pawns you know, on the chessboard. Uh, is this uh, you? You heard at the outset of the conversation, Jean de Glignasti, uh, uh, Anton Barbashin expresses his puzzlement at uh, at the motives of uh, of the Russian president. Is this the same Vladimir Putin who you knew when you were in post from two thousand nine to two thousand thirteen? Well, when I was ambassador in Moscow, the president was Medvedev. And uh, Medvedev uh, was a libor. N nominally speaking, shall we say, since it was yes. Vladimir Putin, the man in charge then. Yes, but uh, he had some uh, leeway from uh, the, his prime minister, because at that time Putin was the prime minister. But, and so the president has had a leeway, for instance, for uh, approving more or less uh, the French intervention in uh, Libya. He, he paid a lot for that, by the way. Uh, most probably it cost him uh, his uh, new mandate as a president. But anyway, the atmosphere was completely different, completely different. It was the time of the reset. Uh, at that time, uh, um, the um, Russia entered the WTO and the World Trade Organization. And so everybody hoped that uh, there could be some kind of normalization with Russia. But so why this un provoked push now for uh, Eastern Ukraine and perhaps beyond? Because um, at that time, you had a president in uh, Ukraine uh, who was uh, Yanukovych, who gave President Putin or President Medvedev some insurance about three important facts for Russia. First, the neutrality of Ukraine. Second, the possibility to speak Russian when you go to the, to, to the city office or whatever for official 
demarches, and third, a lease on the Sebastopol base. And these three elements were completely reassuring for the Russians. And at that time, we thought that the Ukrainian crisis was over. But, uh, of course, after the Maidan uh, revolution, all these elements disappeared, and then it destabilized, more or less, the uh, Russian policy. But why policy. pick the fight now? Why? Why now? Why, why now? Because no. uh, the Russians uh, noticed that uh, there was uh, also some kind of military build-up in Ukraine, that is, uh, NATO was pouring little by little, but more arms, more, or more uh, training, uh, and, uh, and all that, of course, uh, was uh, uh, almost the red line for the Russians. So you're but, saying NATO provoked this? I wouldn't say that, but I would say that uh, the, uh, the Russians had a, a, a fundamental aim, that is the neutralization of Ukraine. It's a red line. He said that several times. It has been uh, the. Uh, I mean, you can see that. Uh, you can read that in all the official papers. In, I mean, the doctrine, strategic doctrine, white papers, and all that for years. So there is a moment. And by the way, and they thought also that it was the right moment to do that. Natalia Puzirev, there was this moment in October. There, were, I believe it was in October. It was a few months back. Uh, when uh, there were separatists who uh, suffered a setback, there were the use of Turkish-made drones uh, by Ukrainian government forces. But was there this NATO egging on the Ukrainian government forces and provoking Putin? No, I, I, I think it's um, it's that Ukraine is 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 moving and getting closer to Europe, that's, that's, that's a, the thing that maybe uh, Putin is uh, fearing the most. There's, a, I would say, a kind of fatal attraction of uh, Ukraine and, and uh, other countries for a European democracy. And, uh, and Putin uh, is acknowledging the fact that people are turning more in Ukraine towards uh, um, Western values. And I think this is um, making himself very insecure because this could happen to Russia as well. Uh, Putin reign is, uh, is, uh, is not ended, but um, they, um, he may be afraid by the contagion in the region over you know opening to the to the western world to the to the uh, european union and at the same time there's a military aspect for sure and the um, ukraine uh, army was building up that's true so i think it's the conjunction of both factors uh, anton barbashin is it also because while the world economy right now is booming uh, commodity prices are skyrocketing and there was this window of opportunity where uh, now, with the price of oil closing in on $100 a barrel, Russia knew perhaps that it has um, the spine to uh, withstand any sanctions that may come its way. Look, I think you are trying to be too rational about this decision. First of all, Russia started its campaign on Ukraine in 2014, annexing Crimea, then started the war in the east of Ukraine. So these processes have been going for years now. And at that time, it was un it was not provoked by Ukraine in any way. It was not about the identity. It was not about Ukraine's Western aspirations, because everyone in Kremlin knew quite well that Ukraine is not joining NATO. Uh, things changed for Putin because he's staying in power for over 20 years. He's been obsessed with history. The last year, he spent writing articles about history and the value of history. Why he's doing it now? Well, partly because... Merkel is gone. There is this moment in time when Russia still have enough resources to pull it through. He believes Biden administration is too weak. Mm. There's a chance. But the ultimate motivation is not rational. It's irrational. It doesn't make sense. It does not promote Russia's strategic mm. interests. And by the way, uh, Russian troops, we've been talking about it, they're not just amassing uh, to Ukraine's southeast, as we've been focusing on. Uh, this Tuesday, radar imagery captured uh, uh, by Capella Space and analyzed by researchers in the U.S. at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies shows hardware to the north of Ukraine's border. This is a little under 50 kilometers from the city of Kharkiv. 
Well, let's uh, cross to the capital and France 24 uh, correspondent uh, Gulliver Cragg. Uh, Gulliver, uh, with armored vehicles uh, seen, un unmarked armored vehicles in uh, Donetsk, movement across the border to the north of where you are. Uh, every day I've been asking you and every day you've been telling us how uh, uh, the people in Kiev keeping their calm, are they still keeping their calm this Tuesday? I think people are generally a lot more worried after Vladimir Putin's speech, coupled with the recognition of the so-called Lugansk and Donetsk People's Republics as independent, and then coupled with that statement today that Russia recognizes those republics according to the borders defined in their constitutions, which essentially means Russia supports their claims on the parts of Donbass that Ukraine currently controls, and that means huge cities like Mariupol, Kramatorsk, Slavyansk, Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, which were briefly under separatist control in 2014, but which have since really gone through quite significant efforts, Mariupol too, actually, to sort of Ukrainianize civil society there has begun to take root, although there are still places where there are a lot of pro-Russian-minded people. There are certainly um, places that have uh, become more Ukrainian in the past eight years. I was in Kramatorsk recently. The city center um, a few years ago was refurbished, was redone. There were people having a protest in the center of Kramatorsk, pro-Ukrainians who were gathering for peace there, speaking Ukrainian and saying that they absolutely uh, could not countenance the idea of being taken over by Russia. And uh, I dread to think really how those people in places like uh, Kramatorsk or Mariupol uh, are feeling after that announcement today. After that announcement today, and you, you heard what Anton Barbashin had to say, what's the calculus where you are on why Vladimir Putin is going all in? I can't hear in? you, I'm afraid. Can you hear me now? I don't know if we've lost the connection. No, we've not lost the connection, but we'll try to reconnect with uh, with Gulliver Craig and, 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 and get back to him in a moment. Jean-Claude de Guignesti, your reaction to, uh, there to, to w effectively, since 2014, Vladimir Putin's actions have... And we, we heard Natalia Puzirev say it as well. Uh, may Ukrainians go further towards the West? Yes, it's true. It's true. I think this last uh, uh, eight years uh, create some national sensitivity in, uh, in, um, in Ukraine. And you have a nation growing. Mm. I would say a nation is born, mm. almost. And a nation is born, and uh, now it's the question of what the West does in the middle. Uh, we've heard all day long uh, sanctions being announced, the biggest one so far, out of Berlin. The German Chancellor announcing uh, a halt to the now-completed Nord Stream 2 Baltic Sea gas pipeline project. Once operational, it would double the flow of Russian gas directly to Germany, bypassing Ukraine. I've asked the Federal Ministry of Economics to withdraw the report on supply security with the Federal Networks Agency to make sure that this pipeline cannot be certified at this point in time, and without this certification, Nord Stream 2 cannot operate. Natalia Puzirev, there was a lot of suspense over whether Germany would, yes. would halt that. Were you, were, did you think that they, would, that they would perhaps blink or waver, or did you know that they'd be on board? Now, it's, it's a very important move. As a few weeks ago, they, uh, the Germans uh, still wanted to separate, to split the economical issues of the political issues. And uh, I think that the Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, uh, acknowledged the fact that um, now he, he cannot... Um, uh, he, he cannot uh, withdraw from this decision, important decision, to uh, of retortion of saying we are not going to certificate uh, the the pipeline. So it's a very important move. It shows there's a kind of unity amongst all the actors uh, in Europe, uh, but also with the uh, American allies. So um, I think and, there's and, a it, and it pretends unity. to uh, to uh, perhaps what may be a real sacrifice on the part of the Germans. They've started to denuclearize their energy grid, so they're more reliant on natural gas than here in France. But here, too, we're entering a presidential election campaign's home stretch. And uh, if uh, the war, and we saw the price of oil go closer to $100 a barrel, continues to rise, 
uh, it's will people think about Ukraine and show solidarity with Kiev or will they be saying, hey, why am I paying so much uh, to fill the tank? It's obviously a major issue for, for the French people and for the politics on the eve of a, of a presidential election. I think uh, nowadays people can understand that the international situation is uh, is moving in such a, uh, a way that that there will be a lot of tension on the on the price of oil as well. But we have alternatives. I think we are resilient enough in Europe regarding you know the 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 gas um, that is supplied to to Europe. Um, Germany has been building up its. Um, it's renewable energy park. Uh, there has to be solidarity. There are options regarding, you know, uh, gas that could come from uh, from uh, Qatar or elsewhere. Uh, so I, I suppose this will be a, a war of, of nerves as well regarding we heard, energy supplies in Europe. We heard on Breakfast Radio the the woman who ran against Emmanuel Macron in the second round, uh, last time round, Marine Le Pen, uh, saying that, you know, those trips to Moscow, they didn't achieve anything. In fact, uh, it was all a publicity stunt, she says. And uh, the fact that, you know, now he's got to throw his hat in the ring and not hide behind the fact that there's uh, the possibility of war in Ukraine and declare himself officially as a candidate. The time will sun soon come when uh, uh, the president will declare as a candidate, but uh, everyone um, uh, <coughs> can assess that the situation is really not favorable for, for, for him to move right now because the situation is so complex. And I think um, he did a, a great job as both president of France, but also uh, president of the European uh, Union Council to, um, to, to, you know, to, um, uh, bear the, the voice of um, of uh, Europe and 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 um, and uh, stand up for a dialogue with Russia because everything has to be and all the triggers have to be pulled by the by diplomacy before we we come to such a, uh, an end. What did you make, Jean de Glignasty, of Emmanuel Macron's trips to Moscow? I think he would have paid a high price if he didn't do that. Mm. And he did do that. It was his job. He, he did the job, and uh, and I think, of course, when you are when when tr you are trying to mediate, of course, you are not sure of the results. And by the way, I think the Russians made a huge mistake by discarding the the, the French and the German capacity to to find new solution. Uh, Anton Barbashin, let me ask you because uh, the coverage of Macron's trips. In the U.S. press, especially in Washington, was oh, uh, Putin has succeeded in dividing uh, NATO allies. What was your reading of those two trips? Well, I mean, what it comes down to, the diplomacy failed ultimately. I mean, historians will let us know what was offered, whether it could have worked, but again, what it comes down to, uh, Russia decided not to use diplomacy to go against diplomacy. Minsk process is dead. I mean, there will have to be new efforts, diplomatic efforts, to try to pacify the situation in the forthcoming weeks, months. But whatever was before, including Macron's trip, has failed. Could diplomacy have succeeded? I don't know. It's a good question. Probably only the historians will let us know. I don't know whether Russia was actually engaged uh, realistically in diplomatic efforts or were they just preparing for, for the assault? Because mm -hmm. we did see the forces being gathered near the border since the spring of last year. So, I mean, it, not, it didn't start just a few weeks ago. It's been ongoing for a while now. And uh, the last I checked, um, the meeting on Thursday in Geneva between Sergei Lavrov and Antony Blinken had not yet been canceled. Forgive us if you're watching the rebroadcast. Uh, is, is, should that meeting take place? I doubt it makes sense now. But mm. once again, uh, no. one, one of the key things you could take away from Putin's speech last night was that he considers Washington the only place, the only uh, voice to, to, to speak to. So if 
the only person who's capable of influencing what's happening in Ukraine, aside from Putin himself, is President Biden. So yes. maybe, yeah, maybe go for the blinking meeting. Jean de Guignasti? Yes, you had two tracks. Uh, one is uh, the Normandy format to implement the uh, Minsk agreement. Which today Vladimir Putin said was dead. Which Putin killed, of mm -hmm. course. And the other one is the overarching negotiation with uh, the US about security in the world, uh, nuclear f forces and so the conventional forces. So I think you can deal with the the question of the of neutralizing more or less uh, Ukraine and give some kind of satisfaction to the Russians if you deal with conventional forces, uh, confidence building measures, uh, limiting the deployment of uh, nuclear missiles. And so you can give some kind some kind of uh, insurance to the Russians. As I told you before, the, for the Russian, the red line is the, the neutrality of, uh, of Ukraine. And so the many things are but by at the going end in, of, by Russia, crossing of America. The, by crossing the Rubicon, that whole second part of uh, what the Russians wanted, which is essential, uh, reviewing a security framework in Eastern Europe that hadn't been looked at since the end of the Cold War, that's dead. They're not... the, the the Americans and the NATO allies are not going to negotiate. I'm sorry, I didn't get your question. What is that? The, 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 the U.S. and the NATO allies discussing the security framework in Eastern Europe now. Isn't that off the table once, once Russia makes its move? No, I don't think so. No, if if the two ministers meet, it means that the negotiation is going on on conventional forces mm -hmm. and uh, nuclear missiles. I mean, it under bracket. I, I am, uh, but anyway, they will have to negotiate that. Would it be a good idea to keep on negotiating? On no, it's always a good idea to keep on negotiating. But I'm I'm uh, not. Uh uh, over optimistic about the issue because, in fact, uh, Vladimir Putin made some requests uh, last year in December, and the allies uh, answered by some proposal, like uh, uh, you know, transparency on on the air defense system, and and a few proposals were on the table already, and Vladimir Putin didn't dare uh, responding to that. So why so he's not should that he interested in it? Why should he? Didn't? Yes, because I think he's, he's pushing, he's, uh, he's moving his pounds, and his pounds, are, his game is, is different for sure. He, he wants to accomplish, and maybe it's not that rational, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, uh, maybe he's preparing his legacy, and his legacy is about, you know, uh, um, reconstructing a, a sphere of in influence, whatever the price may be, for the people in Europe, but even for the people in Russia. Uh, s sitting where you are, Gulliver Krag, in uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, capital, Kiev, uh, is it clear now that uh, for Vladimir Putin, uh, having those parts of Ukraine that he wants was more important than uh, reviewing uh, the security framework in Eastern Europe? Well, I think that's what a lot of people in Ukraine have been saying for a long time. But of course, opinions do vary about what Vladimir Putin's real priorities are. But from everything he said in that discourse on history, which repeated a lot of what he'd written in that essay, which he wrote in summer 2021, or which was written under his name. Anyway, he does seem to really in his mind questioned the existence, the right to exist of Ukraine as an independent state. He repeated all of those talking points again, though today uh, he was again playing uh, with uh, his uh, audience by saying, of course, uh, we're not talking about restoring that empire. But this is also what we've seen so many times from Vladimir Putin is he will say something that sounds extremely threatening and almost clear in its intention, such as uh, in that speech yesterday, we will teach you what real decommunization means just after having explained that it was the communists who gave Ukraine, according to Vladimir Putin, basically half of its territory, the eastern half, very much implying that he wanted to take that away. And then today suggesting it was ridiculous to think that that might be my intention or something like that. I mean, it's really the tactics of a bully uh, that Ukrainians are watching and thinking that they are looking at a bully who, in the eyes of many Ukrainians, has gone mad. I think that's really the, the phrase I've heard the most often from Ukrainians since that uh, speech by Vladimir Putin, is people just looking rather ashen-faced and saying, 
he's really gone mad. He's really gone mad. People really, you know, think they don't know what they can expect from Vladimir Putin. And the main thing is that they are worried that they can no longer expect the Russian president to necessarily act rationally, and therefore arguments about how bad in the medium term this offensive on Ukraine might be for Russia maybe don't actually apply. So, so Gulliver, I've already been dressed down once in this, in this discussion by Anton for uh, applying uh, Western logic to, to, to what's going on inside of the Kremlin. But I'll ask you, if you're the West at this point, do you ratchet up the sanctions uh, at, at a slow increase or do you dial it up to 10 right away? I'm not really qualified, I think, to uh, make an assessment about what the best sanctions policy is. I mean, clearly, there's a logic to both things, isn't there? One is Joe Biden, the US president, has been saying for months that he will apply unbelievably strong sanctions, the like of which Russia has never seen before. Um, and. Uh, that that would happen immediately. Some US officials have been saying that they won't do it gradually anymore and that maybe that kind of shock would be uh, better to influence uh, Vladimir Putin. Others say, no, you apply some sanctions so that you can then threaten to tighten it um, even more if, the, if, if he goes further. But I do think that the announcement yesterday by Joe Biden that he would sanction the just the separatist uh, republics that Russia recognized and has been supporting since 2014. I mean, that was absolutely ridiculous because those republics are already illegal entities. As far as I know, it would have been illegal for any US company to do business with them anyway. I'm not sure that those sanctions have any meaning whatsoever. So that was seen as a pretty bad sign uh, in Ukraine if that was all he was going to do. But Ukrainians are waiting. Uh, the Ukrainian government in particular is expecting uh, Joe Biden to announce uh, something a bit more muscular this evening. And we heard more muscular earlier from Germany. We talked about it from the European Tw Union 27 as well, uh, which announced a series of measures, including cutting access to Russian state funds to, uh, to financial markets in the EU. Britain announcing it was sanctioning five Russian banks and three oligarchs, including Gennady Timchenko. He's chair of Russia's ice hockey league. Uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland also asked about football in the House of Commons. And, Mr Speaker, on his point about uh, sporting events, as I said earlier on, I think it's inconceivable that major international uh, football uh, tournaments uh, can take place uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Russia after, uh, as I say, the invasion of a sovereign country. Yeah, that was the, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Ed Davis, who had... Uh, had uh, uh, asked if uh, the Champions League final should still be held <coughs> in Vladimir it. Putin's uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, uh, Anton Barbashin, uh, your thoughts on uh, uh, these moves out of, uh, out of London on that front. Is that a sanction that would hurt if, they, if uh, UEFA, which gets funding from Gazprom, by the way, uh, was suddenly convinced to move the Champions mm -hmm. League final? No, it actually helped. Putin's cause because it will show ah, that um, basically UK is ready to take away something that Russians might enjoy, something that has to do with pride, that something that view, they view have nothing to do with politics. So that is actually going to uh, strengthen, strengthen his cause and his overall logic. And his logic in explaining this to the Russian population is that they will sanction us no matter what, not because of what we do, but because of who we are. So with that regard, the, this type of sanctions, like sporting events, uh, would only strengthen the cause of Putin's regime. And your thoughts on uh, uh, Boris Johnson uh, singling out those three oligarchs? That should have been done a long time ago. <laughs> Why them in particular? Well, those are the three closest allies of Vladimir Putin. Oh, those then. are the people that help essentially maintain the regime. There's a number of other people among the among, uh, Russian elite who hold a lot of wealth in the UK, in France, and other countries that could be targeted. That would not hurt ordinary Russians, but it would send a strong signal that this type of behavior is condemned by the uh, European Union, UK and United States. Would fans of Chelsea football clubs support Boris Johnson if he sanctioned the owner, Roman Abramovich? Well, why does he have to be on the list? That's a different question. 
So that, that, that list has to be smart. Roman Abramovich is not essentially in the inner circle of Vladimir Putin. That one doesn't make sense, but Timchenko is. And, so. and what about the end of, because I'm asking you, because you're in Glasgow right now, the end of this golden visa uh, regime where you, you pay money and you e much easier get a visa to go to England? Well, I think any measure that makes it hard to steal money from Russia, from Kazakhstan, from anywhere in northern Eurasia, and pocket it in London or Paris or anywhere, should be welcomed by all of us, because it makes sense and, and helps ordinary people to uh, support democratic principles. So we've been focusing on this a lot, Natalia Puzirev. Of course, there's a lot of Russian money in places like the French Riviera. Is Emmanuel Macron considering uh, any kind of sanctions against uh, those who park their money here in France? Well, he announced, the Elysee announced a very targeted sanctions. So I suppose by that uh, we could imagine that, uh, yes, individuals could be targeted uh, as well on the French soil. And how effective would that be? Um, well, it's the same everywhere. Um, you target uh, specific individuals, so it can hurt their families, their relatives, you know, so it can have a, a kind of a blast effect. But I think it's moreover, it's the, un the, the fact that we, we have a, a united response. Uh, the Germans have decided, um, you know, not to certify the uh, Nord Stream the pipeline, Nord Stream to pipeline. The Brits are putting up some new uh, sanctions. And uh, I must say that um, Erdogan and even China, they didn't well receive the fact that um, President Putin would uh, recognize uh, separatist regions because this is not good at, at all for them. It's not a good signal because they are fearing themselves for themselves separatist actions. So it means that by the end of the day, Putin may be very isolated. And one day or, or another, the Russian population will, will be aware of, of, uh, of the fact that Russia has been uh, put, uh, you know, um, outside of the international scene by its leader. Has Vladimir Putin misread the room? How, I'm sorry. Has he misread the room in terms of he thought that perhaps the international community would be so far more divided than it's been? No, I don't think so. I think he prepared himself for the worst. Um, regarding sanctions, uh, they have established a new, a new a Russian system for visa cards, a Russian system for SWIFT and so on. So I think they, they've been preparing themselves for a long time for uh, very harsh sanctions. They've been preparing themselves for harsh sanctions. Uh, the narrative we've been sold is that, well, Russia can just turn its back on the West now and do more business with China. Is that the future, though? Well, they have no choice at the present moment. I mean, if the sanctions uh, um, destroy the uh, exchange, the trade, uh, the investments in Russia, the Russians will have to deal with uh, China, obviously, which is, by the way, not the... I mean, the Russian people doesn't wish mm -hmm. such uh, an evolution, I mean, such a change. I mean, they are looking to Europe, in fact. Mm. Uh, Anton Barbashin, um, the... Uh after 2014, uh, the Russians proved resilient in the face of sanctions. Uh, you just heard Jean de Grignasty say how uh, Vladimir Putin's been preparing for the worse. Yeah, he was. He was, and he was preparing a lot of reserves. He was preparing the state to sustain sanctions. And he was using propaganda for that matter quite effectively. For instance, there is this so-called anti-sanctions, Russian measures to ban European goods from entering Russia as a response to EU sanctions. And the majority of Russians think that Europeans introduced those measures. But I have to add, and that it is really important, that the majority of Russians, as of recent polls, were for, in favor of strengthening relations with the EU and uh, United States. They are against war. So... It is not actually an easy uh, situation, and Russian propaganda will have to do its magic once again, like in 2014, to convince the nation that it is worthwhile that Ukrainians do deserve the horror that 
Russian army might bring them. And again, this will also depend on how many people will, will die, because that would be a major factor. That was a factor of success of 2014 in Crimea, because there was almost no blood. But if uh, people start dying, that's going to be a total picture altogether for Putin and Russia. And has Vladimir Putin talked himself into a corner? There is no alternative to war? Uh, there is always an alternative. I just, I just not convinced that he wants that alternative. Natalia Puzirev? Yes, uh, I, I think he has uh, its own, uh, his own agenda and that he's not really uh, um, favor favorable to the Russian people. Um, I think the Russian society, civil society, is very resilient, but it, it will take time, maybe it's a long process, but by the end of the day, they, they might find out that the, the, their leader is not acting for their, the good of the people in Russia. Jean de Grigny, yes, you. Well, there are two options. Uh, one could be that um, um, recognizing the, the two fake states is a sort of uh, consolation prize because it didn't succeed in uh, securing some kind of uh, neutralization of ho the whole Ukraine. That second op option is a, sort of a platform to send further uh, uh, expansion, I mean, troops, and uh, so I'm not sure which one is the right one. All right, the future is unwritten. Jean de Glignasti, I want to thank you. I want to thank as well Natalia Pouzirev, uh, Anton Barbashin for being with us uh, from Glasgow. I also want to thank our teams of correspondents who are uh, following the situation uh, on the ground, and thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.